our Holy Father, our great God, our King, our Father of our Lord Jesus, our big brother, and our and our teacher, the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for all you being here today and that the Holy Spirit will teach us some things. And please, Father, bless us that we will understand what is being said today, even if it doesn't come out quite the way it to make sense. So, Father, bless us and guide us and give us strength to do your will. Open our hearts to the Holy Spirit that he will teach us the things that we need to learn today. Remind us of some things and guide us in the way of righteousness and of learning how to love you the way Jesus loved you. And we ask all these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, our big brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. I gave this sermon yesterday, and uh, it seemed to come off a lot better than I thought it was going to. You know, sometimes when you're preparing a sermon and the Holy Spirit is giving you the message to give, it makes little sense. Sometimes it just doesn't. And this was one of those. And as I was writing the thing out, I go, this makes no sense. So you write it some more, and you think about it some more. Okay, that makes a little better sense. And you write some more. Oh, that doesn't make any sense. You know, what, is, what, are, what are you getting at here, Holy Spirit? Well, anyways, it came together yesterday at the moment I opened my mouth. That was really interesting, you know, because as a Christian, we have to trust God. You know, there are times we get into things that we don't understand why. And things happen, and sometimes we get mad and we get upset. And those things have been happening to me. And we'll talk about those a little bit. But first, I want to start out with, you know, we live in a country where there's a great deal of what they call disinformation. Sometimes it's only a slight variation of the truth. Sometimes it's a complete, total lie. And the problem we have is, as a human being, the more we hear something, the more likely we are to believe it. You know, we have a whole bunch of this politically correct stuff going around. You can't use that word. You can't say that. You can't do this, that, or the other thing. And we pretend to start to believe this stuff. People talk about, you know, my children. My youngest is 27. My oldest is 39. Huh? 37. Okay. Yeah, 10 years between them. From that 10 years of my oldest child to the youngest, my youngest, you cannot tell her that homosexuality isn't okay and normal. My oldest son, if you tell him that, he'll take your head off. Interesting. 10 years of disinformation that have been given to our children through our schools and everything else they hear and see. And so, of course, they tend to believe it. And as a Christian, we have to be very, very careful not to allow that to happen. There is only one truth in this world, and it's right here. This is truth. Everything else is a variation of this truth. And some of it is just blatant, flat-out lies. One of them that is really interesting and came home to me at work, at lunch, I sit in my car because I can't stay in the building or they won't leave you alone, and I listen to the radio, the talk shows. And um, one of the talk shows got into our new health plan. And this guy is kind of a middle road, moderate type of a individual. And he was talking about, on the far left, we have guys that are preaching that if we go with the new Republican health plan, 23 million people will be thrown off and they will die. And he preached that. And he preached it and he preached it. And guess what? Some poor soul actually believed it, went into a baseball practice and tried to kill a bunch of senators. The man who preached that is responsible for that shooting. And it's a blatant lie. If you read the plan, what they have done is the original plan that President Obama got for us, and it's a good thing. We need that plan, or at least we need a plan for health care in our country. That, that, our, that uh, plan was over a thousand pages. And in that thousand pages, the wording was so convoluted that even President Obama couldn't understand it. 
And so they didn't even do parts of that plan. So what the Republicans are doing and the Democrats that are with them, they're rewriting the plan, throwing out all the junk. And now it's down to about 250 pages. And nobody's going to get thrown off health care because health care isn't for the wealthy. It's not. They don't need it. They pay their own. It's not for the middle class and upper middle class. We pay our own through our jobs generally. It's for the people who don't have the money to pay for it. That's who it is for. And there's nobody in this country who doesn't agree with it. What we're fighting over is how do we pay for it? That's what the whole fight is over. And your far left Democrats who are breathing fire want it to be totally free for everybody that can't afford it. The Republicans, on the other hand, go, well, if you make it totally free, there'll be massive abuse. It'll cost so much, we won't be able to afford it. So in their plan, there's some co-pays. And they're trying to figure out how do you get people who don't need it to pay for it, like the young. Most young kids don't need health insurance. At the early stages of their life, they don't have any problem. They go and get their physical, they get their teeth checked, they get eyeglasses. That's about all they need. And so they don't want to pay $500 a month for health insurance they're not going to use. So these are problems that they're addressing. The, the disinformation is they hate you. They don't care about the poor. They want to kick all the poor off so that they can have more money for themselves. So just be aware that there's disinformation out there and be very careful what we believe. Also, we need to be careful as Christians not to condemn. Most of those people who are giving disinformation are angry. They're upset. They don't have God in their lives. They're miserable, power hungry, and money hungry. They're trying to feel good about themselves through finances. I got lots of money. I can buy whatever I want. I'm God. I am the power here. I tell you what to do. Understand that that's the case and pray for them. Ask, the, ask God to enter their lives so that they can become like everybody in this room. Basically happy. Basically contented with their lives. Going somewhere. Now, we all know that God has given us free moral agency. He has allowed us to make choices. But when it comes down to it, it's really the one choice. Do you choose to live forever with God, or do you choose to die? Or live without God forever, if that's the way it is, however God does it. But the thing is, once you've made that choice, really your free moral agency ends. Because you've chosen to go God's way or go the other way. But once you've chosen to go God's way, everybody in this room has got to study this book and live by it. But because we live in a world where deception is so powerful, Satan is so strong, the demons are everywhere. They're looking at our hearts and our minds and our souls. They know our great weakness. But, you know, I was thinking something about this was after the sermon something somebody said to me. You know, if you have a great weakness, let's say your great weakness is pornography. And you spend all your time making sure that pornography doesn't get you again. Satan knows that. So what is he doing? He's looking for a smaller weakness that he can exploit. That he can get at you without you knowing it. This happened to me recently. You all know that Lowe's has changed the way they do their upper management. And I was caught up in that, and now I am looking for another job. What I didn't realize is how upsetting that was. How angry it made me. And of course, when you're upset and you really don't know why, everybody else, without, with just one exception, were saying how we were abused, how this was a horrible, bad thing. They shouldn't have done it to us. We didn't deserve this. 
It's not going to work. It's going to fail. And all the negative side of it. What I didn't realize is I started to buy into that. When you hear it long enough, disinformation kind of stuff, because they couldn't prove any of what they were saying. They don't know if it's going to work or not. They don't know why one was chosen over another. We can guess, but that's just a rumor. That's just gossip. The fact of the matter is they made the decision, and now we need to react to it, accept the fact of what happened. And in the course of that, so it's been about, what, six months since that happened, something like that, about six months, I found myself hating my job with a passion, just hating it. And every situation went negative, whether it was really negative or just in my mind. And when I realized what was going on was when this sermon started. This came to my mind about a month ago when I started thinking about this. I was just reading the scripture, and I, and I came across the word, and that word triggered it all. And I realized that something had happened. I had started to believe the disinformation. And that disinformation caused a great deal of pain and for me and for everybody around me. I became very, very negative. My body started to break down. All kinds of things started to go wrong. I ended up in the hospital. Like Rick, I learned a few things. So now I'm better off than I was. A very expensive lesson. It's going to cost us about five grand for that little lesson. But it's worth every cent. I learned that I cannot drink caffeine. My body just goes nuts. So remember, we have free moral agency. We can choose. But if you've gone to God and you've gone to the foot of that cross and if you've bowed down and if you've told God like the song, say, I am yours, do with me as you please. From that moment on, we don't have free moral agency. Not in the form that we had before. We do. God will allow you nothing. He allowed me to slip off into the pit. But because he loves me, and I love him, and I told him a long time ago that he has full charge of my life, when it was at the right moment, I learned a lesson. And all of our lives are that way. But we have to be really careful that we pay attention to what's being said out there and don't believe the stuff that disagrees with God. Be careful, because we can get sucked in. You know, just like I said, God is with us. And when we start to fall off the track, at some point, he is going to step in, in a positive way. But what about the rest of the people out there that haven't chosen God to be in their lives? How does he treat them? I've noticed in Scripture that God allows bad stuff to go a long way. In Jeremiah's time, it, Jerusalem had become way out there. They hated God. They wouldn't thank him. They wouldn't praise him. They didn't want nothing to do with him. They knew who he was. They told him to take a hike. And so God, in Jeremiah, he decides he's going to destroy them. In Jeremiah, the chapter of Jeremiah 6, the whole chapter, God talks about how bad they become, how men do horrible things with men and women do horrible things with women, and how they abuse each other, and how the priests uh, steal and take for themselves their power crazy, and all this stuff. And then he says, because you won't come back to me, I'm going to destroy you. And these were his people. And you know, God does not change. So what happened? At the end of that verse, he talks to Jeremiah at the chapter, and he's told Jeremiah, you're like a, a, a metalsmith. You're refining metals, you're refining metals, you're refining metals. But these people are like reprobate silver. You know, reprobate means unprincipled, totally bad. And so, you know, a, a, ref, a person that does refining, he would throw that silver back and refine it again. 
And that's essentially what God is doing. When he punishes them, when he does all the horrible things he's going to say to them, those that survive are going to go, oh, maybe I should love God. Maybe I should honor the covenant that my ancestors made with God. They're going to stand up. Let's turn to Romans 1, 18 through 25. Let's see. Yeah, it's about God's anger at sin. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who push the truth away from themselves. For the truth about God, God is known to them instinctively. God has put his knowledge in their hearts from the time the world was created. People have seen the earth, the sky, and all that God made. They have clearly seen God's visible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. There are no atheists on earth. There aren't. Everybody, without exception, knows that God is. The first law of physics tells you that God is. Something cannot come from nothing. So there's a power that made that little ball of stuff that blew up and became the universe, our scientists say. So don't let anybody ever tell you they don't believe in God. They probably don't believe him. They don't want him to exist. But the fact of the matter is God states that everybody believes in God. He made it that way. That's an instinct for us humans. Because I hear people tell me they don't believe in God and then you get into a conversation. Is, it's not that they don't really believe in him. It's that they're mad at him. They're upset with him. Because they look at God as their personal genie. I want this, God has to give it to me if he loves me. But God's not interested in the physical so much as he's interested in the spiritual. He's interested in what's in here and what's in here. Because that's what goes with us. This all goes away, comes back as spirit, completely different body. So God's not interested in the physical stuff and people just can't understand that. Yes, they, oh, uh, 21. Yes, they know God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas about what God was like. And the result was that their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they became utter fools instead. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people or birds or animals or snakes. You know, when I think about this, this is what this actually came to me yesterday while I was giving the sermon is that this really takes us back to around Adam and Eve's time because it was then that everybody knew God he was right there with them all the time you know they brought offerings to him and he talked to them at those times but sometime in there man decided they just weren't going to worship him and they started making up stuff making up gods and different things work. So this is something that happened a long time ago and hasn't stopped. In our country, it's power, it's money, it's sex, it's controlling people. You know, those are the things that they worship. Those are the gods of our country. And not with everybody by any means. That was proved by our last election. God-fearing people stood up and voted for Trump because they didn't want what the other side was giving. Is President Trump the best man for the job? I don't know. But God can work with anybody. So if God has a plan for Trump, President Trump will do it. At least he claims to be Christian. Hmm? It's part of the plan. Yeah. At least there, we have somebody in the White House that believes in God. I was watching um, a television show, a uh, a news interview or something, and President Trump was in the background sitting at a table uh, discussing stuff with people in his typical way. But right next to him was a Bible. And that was one of the most tattered Bibles I've ever seen. And that was his personal Bible. So he does read. He truly does believe in God. And a lot of the stuff he does seems to be act upon, he acts upon his beliefs. And that's a good thing. 
uh, 24. So God let them go ahead and do whatever shameful thing their hearts desired, and it's been going on ever since. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Instead of believing what they knew was the truth about God, they deliberately chose to believe lies. So we've got to be careful not to deliberately choose to believe the lies that are going around out there, folks. We've got to be real careful, because I can tell you it's easy to get sucked in, especially when it becomes personal, when it's something that happens to you. Everything's different then. When it's happening to others, oh, I can see that. I can be careful. I can stay away from that. But when it happens to you, it's different. Like when a loved one dies unexpectedly. It can really mess you up. So be careful of that. What do you do? You immediately go to God in prayer. That's what you do. So they worship the things God made, but, they, but the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever, Amen. So they wouldn't praise God. They just won't. So one of the things we need to do, remember to praise God. Be thankful. Say thankful. Thank you. You know, even when somebody is really rotten, God reserves to right to, to use them to do good deeds. That is his right. And so whenever you see a good deed, even if it comes from a horrible person, thank God for it immediately. Thank you, Father, for doing that good deed for somebody, whoever it was. Be watchful for them. Look for them. That's helped me a lot at my job at Lowe's. I started looking for the good deeds that others are doing and thanking God for those. And then something happened. The other day, a lady, a guy came in, and he was bent. He was really, really angry. He had worked up a scenario in his mind that was so foul that nobody on earth would ever do that. And so rather than having the ensuing panic, which I normally would have, there was a calmness. Talked to him, found out what really happened, asked him if he had a few minutes, and I started calling all the appropriate people. And by the time we were done, we had a solution for him. We had names and phone numbers and dates. He just looked at me and said, thank you, and walked away. That hasn't happened in months. All when I realized that Satan had used a back door to get to me. Absolutely amazing what God does with us. And then it happened again. Then it happened again. And then I, that's, and that third time, I realized what had happened. And work is fun again. Work is fine. I still get tired from running around all day. But that anger and that frustration is gone. That hatred of a job is gone. And you know what? Now I can move on. Because all the people that got me to my manager position have left or moved, been transferred. So there's nobody in that store that I'm beholding to to stay. God has totally cleared the way. So all I got to do is find out where he wants me to go. But it's all because of that back door. God used that to teach me a valuable, valuable lesson. Let's see, where am I? Okay, and then in 28 of the same chapter, which is Romans 1, uh, God says this, When they refused to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their evil minds and let them do things that should never be done. Now, in the King James, it says to a reprobate mind. You know, reprobate is a word that means, and it hasn't changed in a long time. I looked it up in a couple old dictionaries, and it still means uh, unprincipled or totally bad. So that's one of the things that's happening in our country, and we need to understand that. As people become more and more perverse and more and more wild in their sexual and everything else, their distance from God comes greater and greater. Eventually, God turns them over to a reprobate mind. Which means up until that time, he was with them. He was there. He was working with them. And how was he working with them? One of the things I've known 
and recognized through my life is that my conscience is one of the biggest ways God talks to me and works with me. And for the longest time when people are going the way of this world and becoming more and more evil, you know, doing more and more bad things, their conscience still hurts them a little bit, but they slap it down. A little longer something else happens, the conscience says, this is bad, they slap it down. I'm doing it anyways, I don't care what you say. But eventually something happens to our conscience and in the old King James, they say they have seared their conscience as with a hot iron. They have just burned it out, killed it. And when that happens, I believe that if the scripture is what it says it is, that's the moment when God leaves them. Does he leave them all the way? No, he's still there. But he stops talking to them through their conscience. You know, there's a scripture where in the church, if you're doing rotten stuff, we're supposed to put you out so that Satan can destroy you for a while in hopes that you'll remember how wonderful you had it with God and come back. Well, people that are turned out with a reprobate mind, I haven't found a scripture that says what happens with them yet. Because God is unwilling that any should perish. So chances are the same thing is going on with them. Eventually, they're going to do things that are so horrible that they just won't be able to stand it. And maybe then they will come back, or maybe during that time, God will bring a Christian to them and talk to them about what they're doing. I don't know. But we as Christians need to be out there. We need to be listening. We need to go, when somebody starts talking about God in a negative way, we need to stand up and say, hey, that's not true about God. God is love. God is not an ogre waiting to smack you with a stick. He's not. That's what religion wants you to believe. That's what Satan wants you to believe. That is not true. God is a kind and loving, gentle father. He'll pull you up into his lap and let you cry. He'll play games with you. He'll teach you. He'll give you a wonderful life. And part of the problem in this country is many Christians believe that God is an ogre. They love Jesus because he died for them. But the Father is an ogre. That's not true. If the Father was an ogre, Jesus would be an ogre. The Holy Spirit would be an ogre. They're not. And it's a lie that's been fostered on this world. And a lot of men who call themselves Christians but are not continue to preach it because they want the power. Some preach it because they don't know any better. And that's all stuff that we have to understand. False and disinformation is out there. And the only way that we can be careful and not be sucked in by that is to stay close to God. What are some of the best ways to stay close to God? We've already talked about our conscience. Follow your conscience religiously. The moment you feel guilt about something, that's God saying you've done something that is contrary to his will. That is not a loving thing to do. Act immediately. The other day at work, I was pushing a lift. I felt it bump something. So I looked to make sure I didn't hurt anybody or anything. But it looks like a particular part of a very expensive piece of equipment was twisted over and broken. Now, I didn't know for sure that I did it because I didn't see the lift hit it. There wasn't any blue markings on it. It was a big blue lift. But my, my immediate response was, oh, man, look at that. I, I must have broke that. I should tell somebody. Oh, no, I'll get in trouble. I'm not going to tell anybody. And, of course, the conscience kicked in right away. Instant guilt. Wasn't very much later. I was telling the person who needed to know. Uh, this is broken. I might have done it. I honestly don't know. And is that the end of it? I don't know. Monday I might get hauled in and said, guess what? We're writing you up for that. Okay, whatever. But see, the bad thing about that, if that happens, I cannot change jobs for six months. Which means I would have to go to another company. Which is fine. I don't mind. So our conscience is one of our biggest ways God has given us to know what's right and wrong. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. 
In fact, Rick came up with a real good idea, something that just explains it perfectly. And when we're done with this, he'll get up here and tell you. And I'm going to let him do it because he did it so well. Uh, the next, the other thing we can do is uh, study our Bible. Study scripture. Keep it in your heart. Listen to what it says. So many times I'll be reading along and something will pop out that I'd never seen before dealing with the situation that I'm in. And it's always right. And we can rely on that. And we can make changes based on that. And nothing bad for eternity will ever come out of that. Prayer. Prayer is vitally important for us. As we talk to God and we talk about the things that are going on in our lives, it gives us the time to straighten things out, to see how we really feel. God, this happened today. I'm not sure how I really feel about it. I think I'm upset, but I'm not sure. And as you talk with God, he helps you understand what's going on. Sometimes he'll lead you to a scripture. Sometimes he'll lead you to a friend. Sometimes he'll lead you to a pastor. Sometimes he'll lead you to your dog. And you can be petting your dog and you go, oh, look at that. This is really what's going on. Kindness is what needed to be done. Who knows? You just, you just don't know what God, how God's going to talk to you. Uh, let's see, I lost my place. Spending time with God's people. That's another really good way of knowing what's right and wrong. Listening to what they have to say. Righteous people have been thinking about these things. You can ask them, hey, I heard such and such. What do you know? And if you ask Rick, I guarantee you he'll know something. Because he spends a great deal of time on his computer reading stuff, listening to things, analyzing stuff. He's a good resource. And you feel love when you're with God's people. Because we don't judge. At least we're not supposed to. If you're with Christians that realize that we're not in religion, we're in a body of Christ, that we're the children of the Most High God, that he is our dad and that he's all around us and we're in the middle and he's in us and we're in him, they're not going to judge you harshly. They might say, yeah, you really shouldn't be cheating on your wife. But they're not going to rise up and say, you're the most horrible person that ever lived, beat you up and throw you out the door. Now the pastor might come up and tell you to stop. And if you refuse, he might ask you to leave. But as a ravaged Christian, I would never do that to anybody. Sit down and talk to him. Why are you doing this? What's going on? What can I do? That's God talking to you through one of your beloved brethren. And so we've already talked about how we become reprobate. We refuse to listen to God. We put something other than the love of God and wanting to love God in front of God. And if we do it long enough and hard enough, eventually he will turn us over to Satan. And our minds will become reprobate and it will be bad. Another thing we've got to be careful of is hypocrisy. There's a lot of people in this world that say they're one thing but do another. For us to know the truth, to live the truth and be the truth, it's important that we are what we are. You know, if you come to church and you act one way and you go home and act another way, that's hypocrisy. We need to be what we are all the time. We need to allow people to see who we really are. Hypocrisy is one of the great ways that Satan can get to us. It's a door. Hey, look, this guy's a hypocrite. He wants to be this, but he's really that. But if you come to church and you're mad, and everybody knows you're mad, what's going to happen? Hey, what's wrong? Somebody's going to come up and talk to you about it. And by the time you're done talking, you won't be so mad. Okay, maybe I looked at that wrong. Maybe I took this or that wrong. Okay, I can see. And that's God speaking to you. And if you're living in hypocrisy, it's hard for anybody to say anything to you. Because at church, you look fine. You're a happy-go-lucky Christian. You're perfect in every way. You go home, and you're absolutely miserable again. 
So be really careful that you aren't a hypocrite. It's a very, very dangerous situation to allow yourself to get into. And guess what? I was being hypocritical at work. At, at work, I would act like I was all happy and everything was wonderful and everything was fine, but it wasn't. I find that I was really, really bent. And that hypocrisy went on for a long time until God got tired of it. So be careful. It's easy to be led down the wrong path. Our hearts are wicked. Wicked to a fault. And we've got to be careful all the time what we think. Our human spirit is our doorway to God. And God is in you and he talks to us constantly. As things go on, it's probably going to get worse. Disinformation, lies, the United States separating into two groups, um, all the horrible things that, you know, people whose minds have become so depraved that they're killing people, they're murdering people left, right, and center. Every day you hear about somebody got killed by a policeman or the policeman got murdered by somebody or so-and-so beat up somebody, somebody on the freeway died because of whatever reason the police killed him. You know, on and on and on it goes and worse and worse it gets. Part of that is that media today is so fast. If something happens in China, we know within minutes. You know, that's part of it. But I have personally noticed that it is getting worse and worse and worse. And it's almost a geometric thing. It's going like this. And it's, and it's going to affect our minds. And we need to stay very, very close to God. So, you know, God tells us a few things that we can do. Uh, in Jeremiah 6, 16, he says, Stop right where you are. Look for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your soul. So when things are getting bad, stop. Just stop. Think about your past. Think about what's right and what's wrong. Think about what's going on. Look for the path that got you to happiness. Get back on it. Because if you're miserable and things aren't going well, you've obviously got off it. Like I had gotten off it. And when I realized what the right path was, I got back on it. And now everything is much better and actually getting to be wonderful again. And in 1 Timothy, uh, he says, uh, 4, 11 through 16, keep a close watch on yourself and your teachings. Stay true to what is right, and God will save you and those who hear you. Keep a close watch. Where do we watch ourselves? How do we do that? What is a key to that? Meditation. Do any of you meditate at the end of each day? Lying there before you go to bed. Okay, here's what happened today. This is what happened. This is what I did. This was my response. This is my reaction. Why did I do that? I bit that poor guy's head off. When that guy cut me off, I cussed him. Why did I do that? That's keeping a watch on yourself, on what you do, what you say, what you think, what you feel. You know? I felt anger at that guy for cutting me off. Well, maybe he was in a hurry. Maybe he had to get over to get off. Maybe I should have given him room when I saw a signal. I should have cut him off. All that stuff. And we think about what we have done in the day. And then there's something else we have to do. We have to go, okay, if this happens again, what will I do? How will I respond? What will I think? It's important that we role play with ourselves on those kind of things because you're in a habit of yelling at a person or you're in a habit of doing something or you've gotten into a habit that you didn't have before. Why? We need to analyze that stuff and find out because we're so easily sucked into stuff. And we need to stay on top of it. And 
And in Matthew uh, 6, 19 to 34, God talks a lot about how he takes care of the flowers and he takes care of the animals and everything is wonderful and how a flower is more beautiful than Solomon in all of his glory. And that in the end, he says that he will take care of us. Let's see, let me just go ahead and read it. God will take care of us if we live for him and make the kingdom of God our primary concern. That's the major key. We always have to put God first. Everything we do, say, and think has to be judged against, does this make the kingdom of God and God himself wonderful to the world? Does it? Does cussing at somebody on a freeway make the kingdom of God and God himself look good, look wonderful? Does it promote the kingdom of God? Does cheating on your wife promote the kingdom of God? Does getting so drunk you can't walk promote the kingdom of God? Can not taking care of your home promote the kingdom of God? Does stopping to help a stranger promote the kingdom of God? Does having what we have here help the kingdom of God? Yeah. Those things do. It comes down to good deeds. God loves good deeds. All good things come from God. So the final thing I want to say is for us to withstand the disinformation and garbage that's going on in our world, for us to not fall and become like everybody else, to become just another person out there living for themselves. There's one thing we have to do. We have to make God's ways our ways, period. Because once you can stand up and say, this is the word of, and put your name in there, You got it made. And that's what we're all striving for. Will we have that in our lives? Probably not. But we will in the next. Because God wants to see that we want it more than anything else. It, we are physically, emotionally, and mentally incapable of that. But Jesus is. Jesus came, lived, and died so that the day will come when you get your spirit body, your soul becomes spirit, your human nature is gone, evil will have fled from you, and you will live a life that God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ have lived for eternity for the rest of our lives. And if we can keep that in our minds and realize that God understands that we're not perfect and we're not going to be perfect, but the Father sees us as we're going to be when we're resurrected with our perfect bodies and our perfect souls. That's how he sees each and every one of you. He doesn't see our sin. He knows it's there. And he knows we're going to have it. But he wants to know without a doubt that you want his way more than you want this way. And you fight at it constantly. When you fall, you get up, you say you're sorry, figure out how it happened, and make a plan so it won't happen again. And remember about the back doors. If you're concentrating on this and being bombarded there, stay close to God because I guarantee you Satan's on the backside trying to find a back door to get to you. I want to close with a prayer. Our Holy Father, our God, our King, these people here love you. And they are learning to love you the way Jesus loves you and the way you love Jesus and the way you love the Holy Spirit and he loves you. Father, help us on that journey. We cannot do it alone. We must be taught. We must be admonished. We must be shown the way. The only thing we can do is have a willing heart and we want that heart. So help us see all the good you do in this world. Help us see all the good you do through bad people and help us always to remember to thank you for that. You are the God of the universe. You are the creator of all things. Everything is yours to do, for you to do as you please. 
So we ask that you please to have our hearts grow towards you and to learn to love you the way you love us and the way Jesus loves you. And we ask all these things in the great lover, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, gave himself totally and completely for us so that one day we can have what he has. And we will. And we thank you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, our big brother, Jesus Christ. Amen.